And welcome into PressBox Live. I'm Stan the Fan Charles of PressBox and PressBoxOnline.com. And with me are Andy Dolich and Marty Conway. And we're going to talk some sports business in just a second. But first, I got to tell you, I got to conduct my own little business here and tell you all about the Costas Inn. That's right. The Costas Inn, located 4100 North Point Boulevard, is one of the one of the big staples for going out to eat crabs in Baltimore. They've got great steamed crabs, crab cakes, crab soup, but they also have an incredible menu of salads, steaks, chicken, uh, desserts, and now you can eat it at home. No, they're not going to deliver it to you, but you can pick it up curbside. Go to their website, costasin.com. You can order your food, pay for your food, leave a tip, and then come by to 4100 North Point Boulevard and pick it up. And one of the great things about the Costas Inn, we're still waiting for the first complaint about uh, your grandmother's crab soup poured over the uh, the cheesecake. Okay, it doesn't happen. They 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 put everything in there immaculately for your pickup. Costasin.com. All right, joining us now, Marty Conway and Andy Dolich. Marty uh, teaches at Georgetown University. Longtime uh, worker in the sports world with the Baltimore Orioles, Texas Rangers, and AOL. Correct, Marty? That's right. Got it all right. Yeah. And Andy Dolich has worked for in, not for every sports team in business. He has worked in each of the big four, the NBA with the Philadelphia 76ers, the NHL with the Washington Capitals. And I left out the Memphis Grizzlies, I'm sorry, in the NBA, the Oakland A's, and the San Francisco 49ers. Andy, did I leave anybody out? Uh, the Vancouver Grizzlies, the Maryland Arrows of the yeah. National Box <laughs> Lacrosse League, uh, fan-controlled football, but that's fine, Stan. Not All right, I hit, I hit on the ones that I remember. You got the biggies. You yeah. got the biggies. And I'm wearing a San Jose Sharks shirt because I got it for free. All right, sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. Uh, Marty, uh, let's let's start out talking about this uh, thing that, that led me to realize that I hadn't spoken to either of you on the Zooms with Gary. Gary couldn't be here tonight. But I saw this thing about the Boston Red Sox. Mm -hmm. Actually, you're getting, I think, is it $170 million from Mass Mutual for patch advertising? When did that get approved by everybody in Major League Baseball? And tell us a little bit about this deal. I'm sure Andy knows about it, and Andy can yeah. chime in as sure. well. Go ahead. Right. So something that has, you know, if you look in Europe and Asia and South America, advertising in Mexico, even in, in soccer, advertising on the uniform on the kit, as they call it in soccer, has been a standard going back decades and, and, and longer and longer. So it's been a lot. First of all, it's been a long time coming to the United States uh, for, for some time. Um, the NBA, of course, the NBA like already usual, does it, right? The NBA was one of the first to do it, if not the first, at least at the big four, big five level to do it. Um, but yeah, in the most recent basic agreements, collective bargain agreement that was signed between the players and owners that we talked about over the winter, the Major League Baseball and the teams got, from, you know, got the ability through bargaining with the Players Association to put a small patch on home and away uniforms, batting practice jerseys other things like this lost in this was uh, a year or so ago the actual the Padres announced a smaller deal I think four years for in the mid 20 million dollars with Motorola uh, and then we didn't hear anything for some period of time until yes just in the last week or so the Red Sox announced a 10-year 170 million dollar deal with Mass Mutual starting next year all teams can put their patches on to the extent they have them there's a couple of interesting things about that number one is there's a lot of value in this in Boston because there's no way you could ever put your name on Fenway Park corporately. That would never work. And so that's an asset that they don't have the ability to monetize. And so they look to maximize in every other way. And so the patch uniform. Now, from what I'm told from people in the industry, there are a number of teams ready to go. I think the two, at least the one New York team, the Mets, apparently have something in the works that could fetch as much as 25 or $28 million a year. So I think you're going to see three or four or five more of these in the wintertime come out. And it is the kind of revenue source that teams have been looking to hit because along with sports betting and some other things, this could generate 
tens of millions of dollars a year for teams and owners um, compared to in the past where it wasn't monetizable at all. Andy, when deals like this are done, they also include, it's not just the patch, right? They become like a major corporate player with the franchise. As, as Marty has said, uh, these, these are iceberg deals, meaning you see the one eighth above the surface, right. but it's the seven eighths below the surface that make these deals work or not. Promotion, community relations, broadcasting, player involvement, um, digital delivery, all of that. And I happened to be at uh, an industry meeting three weeks ago and met the North American executive who runs Rakuten and they right. have the Warriors. And they Marty, Warriors. I think the Warriors have the largest deal in the NBA at like 25 for yeah. the Rakuten bug on their uniform. Yeah. And I had you know, a very nice conversation with their CEO and they're a Japanese company, but this is a way for them to get known in North America. And when what you do have- they do? What do they do, Andy? Are they clothing or are they electronics? No. Rakuten. I I, yeah, I think- They're I a have, tech company. Tech yeah, company. so okay. Rakuten yeah. is, think of Amazon, think of some other mashups because it's, it's a marketplace, it's electronic marketplace and all of that. So- uh, think about it as like Amazon's marketplace where they aggregate and, a lot and, of you know, individuals. To, Marty, to Marty's point, first of all, if you buy the Warriors, you're also buying a young man named Stephen Curry, mm -hmm. uh, who you're getting as part of the deal. And uh, I wrote a piece two weeks ago uh, when I was thinking about stadiums. All right, you have Fenway and Dodger Stadium. And I was going through all the names of the ballpark stadiums and arenas in California. And you have a headache and there were at least 10 companies that don't do business anymore that had their name on ballparks. And the Dodgers and the Reds, uh, the Red Sox, they've had their own places forever. And Dodger Stadium, I shouldn't say never, but they're not taking a corporate naming rights, nor are the Red Sox. Or Yankee Stadium. And what the, do you think, Marty? Now Wrigley Field. No, and Wrigley happen. Field. There's, no. Yeah, yeah. No. There's three or four that will probably never happen. And yeah. and so what what it is to me, it's the NASCARization of uniforms and sponsorships, where you're taking a little bit of everything because you're always looking to generate non-cannibalizing new revenue, and that's the key here. Is, um, so, so just recently, the Boston Red Sox strike me in particular in this question. They, it was a pretty much assumed that the season was going to go by. They would either trade Xander Bogarts or he was going to walk as a free agent. They did an odd thing right at the right before the deadline. Is that we have no intention of uh, trading Xander Bogarts. Is it possible that this new revenue factors into some of that thinking, Marty? Or Andy? Yeah, look, I, I think it's possible. I mean, you're even looking at switching sports for a minute. The Cincinnati Bengals are rumored to be potentially doing a naming rights deal and willing to replace the, the name, current name on the stadium, Paul Brown Field. So, um, I, yeah, I, and Andy and I have talked about this. You know, we go back to together, we go back to the 1984 Olympics and we talked about this. That was the birth of sports marketing. And all this has driven player salaries. So, there's clearly a connection to being able to generate 10 to 20 million or more dollars a year from a single source because of what they expect to have to sign their current players, let alone add other players. And if I may, Stan, I would say that the, my favorite team, which we've talked about before, the Oakland A's and their ongoing uh, Groundhog Day of where are they going to play, the A's have a bit of a different view. They're trading every quality player because they don't have anybody on their uniforms. They right. just have Oakland and they got rid of all these players that used to be in Oakland. Now they're someplace else. There's it's a, the reverse of what we've just talked right. about. Right. There's a rumor that they're looking at getting the gondolas to sponsor the patch. Oh, I've already uh, asked one of my corporate friends to introduce me to granola. I want the granola gondola um, <laughs> okay, to I like take that. people from downtown Oakland 
And isn't that going to be great? Uh, most gondolas maybe have 20 people in them. So you line up for a game, a night game at 11 in the morning. You might get there by first pitch. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, before we move on to other topics, Andy, it's been like five months or so since we talked uh, on here. Can you give us the latest uh, machinations in the Oakland A's saga of building a stadium, moving to Las Vegas? What, what are you, what are the, you Well, hearing? The, the real keys, again, just a few days ago, there are two more really good players gone. Um, and if you look at all the players that have been gone just in the last two years, you have the core of a team that could compete for a championship. They're mm -hmm. all gone because of the A's line. We can't afford these guys because we don't have ballpark revenue. It's self-inflicted. Um, there was a story just a few days ago that one of the Vegas developers had come to Oakland to talk to the A's ownership and Dave Cavill, their president, about what might be a possibility in Las Vegas. And two weeks ago, the uh, environmental state agency, BCDC, very, very important. They approve environmental and other uses of locations. And every people have followed this know the Port of Oakland is where the A's want to build their new right. ballpark at Howard Terminal. This entity, BCDC, gave uh, approval that the A's could build on the 57-acre parking lot, which is being used as a ready parking lot for 18 wheelers. So they're gonna take them someplace else at the port. Two days ago, uh, a consortium of port entities sued the BCDC and the city of Oakland based on their decision. And I happen to know that there's not a secret, but there's at least two or three other submarine lawsuits that are coming here. So. It still comes down to the fact that the A's are playing at the Coliseum. They have nothing that they can announce in Las Vegas, and you're going to have to play in a dome stadium unless you want a fried ball club. And uh, the money that is available to them in Oakland is literally mouse meat. It would never give them anything in terms of infrastructure. So as we've talked about before, um, ad nauseum, John Fisher's owned the team for 17 years. I think we're going into year 18 without a solution to a new ballpark. And uh, throw this one at Commissioner Rob Manfred, you got nothing happening in Tampa either. Yeah. And Rob, the commissioner has said multiple times until he solves or baseball solves these stadium uh, scenarios in both Tampa and Oakland, baseball can't expand for a reported $2.2 billion. And as we've talked about this, Andy, the, the A's have complicated it by picking the most complicated place on the planet Earth to build this new stadium. Oh, there's, there's no doubt. I mean, it, it, Tesla has a gigantic uh, manufacturing plant in the South Bay in the Silicon Valley. I would definitely just call up Elon Musk and say, hey, Elon, we could build this incredible manufacturing facility at the Oakland Coliseum. You know, what was he paying for Facebook? You know, $400 billion or something? Twitter, yeah, 400. Yeah, uh, Twitter, why don't you just throw in a baseball team, Elon, <laughs> and, and you could have it play on Mars, right? You could take it into outer space. Marty, comments? Uh, as, uh, but to point out what Andy touched on there, which is in the meantime, baseball spins in something as important, for example, as expansion because of these two places um, where they can't seem to be willing to pull up stakes and say, look, we did everything we possibly can. Now we have to go. And again, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they want to preserve these expansion locations. So they want to solve Tampa and Oakland in place so that they could take that money because there's not three or four cities for expansion, there may be one or two. And I think that's what the, that's what yeah. the chess match is here. I mean, I, I know that it, it is more fantasy land, but if I had the wherewithal within baseball, the number one expansion city is Mexico City. Right. You think about it realistically, 
in terms of getting to it, the size of the city, the wealth of the city. Of course, it's cross-border, which is a challenge, but holy cow, you're not going to get 2.2 billion in some of the other smaller cities in the United States. It's not going to happen. What, yeah. what are the other potentials? It's Las Vegas. Would we agree that Montreal, there is money enough there in Montreal now to do this? Sacre bleu. Uh, Sacre I, don't, bleu. I, I do not see Montreal as a viable no. candidate because of a lot of internal politics that always pop up in Montreal. Dave but, Stewart, my friend, is leading a group in Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, right. Yeah. And yeah. Nashville, is, Nashville yeah. has grown into a pretty significant force Mm -hmm. in sports and getting stuff done. I mean, yeah. they really came out when they had the NFL draft. Holy mackerel. I mean, that was gigantic for them. Mm -hmm. um, and they're an entertainment city. You know, San Antonio, other places, Portland. Charlotte. I, I just don't Charlotte see could, Charlotte's not going to support it. Don't see it. Yeah. No. Okay. Now there are a couple of successful minor league franchises. We've talked. We've just touched on what those are. But El other than Paso. that, yeah. Other than that, you'd have to have a third team in New York or Chicago or someplace where there's a big enough uh, population growth. So um, that that's baseball's challenge is uh, how many viable candidates there really are for what. what and look at you know we've talked about Tampa and you know, more about Oakland than we should. Think about some of the other quality teams that are now on the downside mm -hmm. that are not doing well. Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, others, you know, that are just quality and stand for baseball from day one. Uh, baseball has to fix that also. Yeah. yeah. Guys, um, there's a lot of different to topics we could talk about. Um, one of the things I wanted to hit on is more, uh, Andy is the passing of Vince Scully the other night. Uh, what has he meant to you? When was the first time you remember hearing him? Any anecdotes about him? I, I always think about you walk down any street today and you see everyone with earbuds, right? Yeah. They got their earbuds. And I just think about millions, tens of millions of youngsters listening to their Emerson radios with earbuds. Their little transistor radio. 65 years ago. Yeah. Cursing Bob Prince or other people where you could get games from hundreds of miles away. Um, Vin Scully, to me, uh, very simply was a Michelangelo with a microphone and the Dodgers Da Vinci. Um, and so many quality voices in sports are just terrific storytellers and who was better than Vin. So uh, he was important to me, you know, starting with the Dodgers when I was a kid growing up on Long Island. And I was very lucky that I got to play golf with Vin Scully and Mikio Matsubayashi who brought diamond vision <laughs> to American stadiums and put the first one in Dodger Stadium. I'll always remember that. So did you used to listen to Vin when you lived in New York when he was broadcasting for the Dodgers? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And okay. I listened to, you know, I watched Happy Felton's Not Whole Gang and Gladys Gooding and all that other stuff. Uh, but Amazing. What's happened, and we think about our age, you know, we're losing legendary individuals that they're not going to create anybody like a Bill Russell yeah. or a Vince Scully. When they're gone, they're gone. Yeah. And that is, to me, the most impactful part of this. I found the, the most interesting story that Bill Russell, they showed an interview he did about 12 years ago, and he was talking about it must have been in relation relationship to Jackie Robinson Day, uh, the fourth year it started. And he talked to the, to the interviewer about the fact that when he first met Jackie Robinson, somebody took him and said, would you, like to, would you like to meet Jackie Robinson? He said, oh yeah, I'd like to meet him. And then when he met him, he was so like, um, you know, falling all over himself to how much he loved Jackie Robinson. And he said, the thing he regrets to this day is he never was accurately able 
to explain to Jackie Robinson what he meant to him. And I thought that was very sort of profound for somebody to have realized about them. The one last thing I'll let Marty go that I will never comprehend. Bill Russell's from Oakland, McClyman's High School. <clears throat> Uh, didn't play varsity till he was a senior. <laughs> didn't play varsity and had one college offer. Yeah. One college offer. Yeah. What? Which which was San Francisco, right? That's right. Correct. That's yep. right. All right. And then Bill Russell played in 21 um, elimination games between NCAA, Olympics, NBA, et cetera, and won them all. Won every one of those. And so I'm always, I have a good friend a colleague here at Georgetown who follows things very carefully and talks about things like that all the time when people start to talk about thinking that the NBA started with Kobe and LeBron and Michael and all that and and uh yeah so uh between Bill Russell Wilt Chamberlain you know those kind of legends and, and again back to Vince Scully for me Vince Scully was the narrator of baseball ever since I listened started listening I wasn't personally able to ever meet him but just the narrator and he could say more by saying less, and that for me was the lesson that I always worked with our t broadcasters, and and I think John Miller was a modern day Vin Scully, some others. They could do more with less, and didn't have to feel like they needed to over talk in the situation. And and again, I think those we've lost virtually all of those people, and um, that that's sort of the gold of a Vin Scully and and people like that. Have you heard yeah, the and, story and with with Bill Russell? You know. He, people thought he was thorny and uncooperative. And of course, everybody talks about the fact that he didn't give autographs to anybody. Yeah. And, but when you really got to the heart of the matter, he just said, look, what is my autograph worth? Try to talk to me, look, right. look at me and have a conversation. What is the autograph going to do? Yeah. And and when that comes across, it shows you the kind of man that he was. He was willing to put uh, up with people inventing that he was so antisocial because he wouldn't sign autographs. Yeah. Like, like with Bill Russell, Sandy Koufax, the same way, because I was a Giants fan. In basketball, I was a Bullets fan. I hated Sandy Koufax, and I hated Bill Russell. But later on, when I grew up and kind of understood life a little better i got to revere both of them mm. and i'm not talking about Kofax because he's he's passed but bill russell i i ended up in the last 20 30 years developing an amazing appreciation uh, arguably the greatest team winner in the yeah. history of american sport yeah. and that's not easily done and as marty said about Ben, you know, he, he brought baseball to hundreds of millions of people. And I think also called the Joe Montana to Dwight Clark catch. He did. He did. In, the, in the end zone, if I remember correctly. He did. did yeah. Andy, I'm just curious if you ever heard this story. And I've heard two, a couple of versions of it over the past couple of days. One was one call, uh, said, called upon you to believe that they actually asked people at the game, the PA announcer made a request that people turn down their transistor radios because there was so much of them being heard that it was too loud. But I've always heard the story that in the early 60s, they loved Vince Scully so much that even though they went to their new stadium, Dodger Stadium, they had transistors to their ears because they wanted Vince depiction of what they were seeing and there were so many broadcasters that fans did that now they're doing it in another way in terms of their digital devices yeah but you know the story about vin and turn down your radios his voice was so pleasurable his manner was so friendly and neighborly uh you know, I didn't think you needed to turn it down and we won't mention any names, but we could come up with 10 broadcasters in five minutes <laughs> that we would like to turn down on the broadcast themselves. The heck with fans listening to it. Yeah. Uh, Marty, um, Adam Silver, if Adam Silver was running the uh, Major League Baseball, would, would they be as embroiled in these two stadium issues in the cities this long in Tampa? and Oakland he oh seems like 
he would he would have moved things yeah. along a lot quicker. Uh, oh my gosh, no! I just said this to a friend today. That can you imagine? We were talking about Shohei Otani and the issue, you know, what he's gotten himself into with the Angels and all that. Imagine if David Stern were running baseball. David Stern would have told the Angels, not approached them, and said, "We're you're going to make this deal." You're going to send Otani to wherever, the Mets or whatever it is. You're going to do that, and here's what you're going to get back because this is good for our game, the best thing that we can do for our, for our game to yeah. do that. And, and Adam Silver is cut from that same cloth, which is to be able to make an assessment. Um, and, but baseball has a history of letting things fester and linger. That's how we got the Washington Nationals, only to the point where baseball had to buy the team from Jeffrey Luria and eventually just move it to Washington because there wasn't anything happening. And so uh, they should have learned their lesson from that is to simply step in and buy the A's or buy the Rays, whatever it is, and just simply say, we're going to move this team in the best interest of baseball. And uh, we're, we're going to get on in the 21st century with where the game needs to go instead of having these sort of roadblocks along the way that are preventing so many other things from happening. To, to swing and Stan and Marty, here's how, dysfun here's how dysfunctional in this particular example. I'm not in the Bay Area, as you know. Uh, I'm in Louisiana, and we won't talk about why I'm in Louisiana. But uh, Shohei Otani, I think, lost to the A's last night. Is that not correct? That's correct. That's right. yeah. And the Bay Area is a gigantic and very diverse and enthusiastic Asian marketplace. The A's didn't advertise no. that Babe Ruth was <laughs> playing in Oakland in this case. Baseball didn't do a darn thing about it, like Marty talked about. Look at your markets. Look at the diversity of this country. Look at building baseball in Japan, in Korea, um, in other places. Adam Silver, bingo, front page, first three seconds, you'd know about this. Yep. And you'd be building the market. It's just another uh, incredible error by baseball when you have a player of that incredible capability who would attract people to buy tickets and they're not selling them. Comment, Marty, or can I move uh, on to my next topic? Yeah, I, I would just say this again. It's it's Andy and I have talked about this a number of times. We could take our show on the road, and that is. Outsourcing the marketing of the game to the 30 franchises is the thing that baseball does the worst and that other sports do the best, which is simply to say, you know what, if you won't do it, we will. We're going to go into each market and spend X amount of money when Shohei comes into town and we're, we're going to help you do that because it's in our greater interest to grow the game and grow interest and we're not going to rely on you uh, sort of like a, you know, a dry cleaning franchise to say, well, I really can't afford to do that. So yeah, we, we talked about this a number of times. NFL commissioner, um, Roger Goodell, what is going on? I, I was totally mystified, but I didn't realize that he again, ultimately held sway over this yeah. Deshaun Watson decision. I thought it was, I was saying, wow, this is refreshing. They're actually going to have a judge kind of hear this or somebody that's going to be judicial and and now they're not going to listen to her six game uh, suspension they don't feel it's it that it meets the the test here so in the last collective bargaining agreement the one that recently was uh negotiated between the two parties this was the change that probably got the least amount of notice yeah that previously the owners had thought that the nfl roger goodell and the shield were getting beaten up too much on this and so they wanted to create an environment where they could essentially give the NFL an option to have this litigation, these disputes be handled there. However, however, they did retain the right to review those and to then appeal them if they didn't think that the punishment was appropriate. So both the NFL and the PA signed off on this. And this was an attempt to sort of lower the pressure on Roger Goodell. But in a case of this size and this magnitude, I think the NFL has decided probably rightly that ultimately what came out of the lit, came out of the arbitration doesn't meet the eye test of yep. here was the conditions of 30 some 20 some women and six games which is basically what Stephen Ross got in the recent fine he got fined a million and a half dollars for tampering and he essentially can't be with his team for six six games mm -hmm. and so that was ultimately so they attempted to do this but in this case they've reserved the right to take that appeal 
and issue it. And the NFLPA will certainly appeal that probably in the federal courts. And one of the circumstances that we've talked about, the NFL as a game is literally a mechanized army that just rolls over everybody and everything in its, in its way. Um, going back to our uh, commissioner with a brain, a heart, a moral compass in Adam Silver, I think Deshaun Watson would have been, see you, Deshaun, forget about playing this year. Yeah. And I don't know if you're going to play again. You're gone. Yeah. And, you know, I always think about Adam's decision with Donald Sterling. Yeah. And I'm not saying that, uh, you know, Steve Ross and Donald Sterling, different circumstances, but that was a big decision that showed people all over the world that Adam Silver was the right guy. And so many of these other individuals fail every day. Hey, um, back in the day that Bud Selig was the commissioner of baseball, there were a number of franchise shifts. I mean, uh, transfers of franchise being sold. And every one of them ended up with a friend of Bud, yeah. basically either owning the team or the president of the team was a friend of Bud's yeah. that Bud approved rubber mm -hmm. stamp. Uh, is it going to be that way with the Orioles if they are sold and with the Washington Nationals? Marty, I'll start with you. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, I, don't no, I didn't mean Bud Selig. I mean, well, Rob, <laughs> yeah, no, no, Rob I, I, have to rubber stamp. No, I don't think Rob Manfred rolls that way in terms of he doesn't have that sort of tether that, that Bud had to because Bud was an owner and understood yeah. what that was. Uh, as, as much as you're around owners, you can never understand it to do it. But I, look, I think it's going to come down to, as it does in most cases, the value of these franchises have gotten up to the point where there are fewer and fewer individuals capable of, of doing that. Ne we never should discount the number of billionaires in the United States, but the number is ultimately a finite number. And so to get somebody who can put that amount, whether it's one third of the ownership capital in the NFL or whatever it is in baseball, to do that. So what you end up with is the runner ups in every situation turn to Steve Greenberg and say, okay, the next franchise is, I want to be involved in that. So any runner ups in Washington will ultimately be on the, the list, um, the ready list for Baltimore or wherever that next franchise that becomes available. And that seems to be the way that it rolls as opposed to in the case of Bud Selig in Washington, handpicking the Lerner family because he knew that Ted Lerner had the capital himself. He knew Ted, he knew that it could be a family ownership. So that seems to be the way it's going. I was talking more about sort of how, while Bud was commissioner, Lucchino got to be yeah. part of the deal in San Diego. Yeah. Then when the Fenway, the Red Sox deal was happening, he Bud was comfortable with Larry being mm -hmm. kind of the president of the Boston Red Sox. Mm -hmm. And then Stan Caston ended up in Washington, yeah. Sandy Alderson, yeah. ended up with the Mets when there right. were some problems there. Yeah, there was after San Diego. Somebody, yeah, there was always somebody that Bud wanted with the franchise. Yeah, that, but, does, but if you look at Rob, yeah. um, the A's are down. Uh, Tampa is way down in terms of valuation. Right. How do you let the A's right in the middle of the Silicon Valley, you know, only be worth $1.3 billion, even though, right. you know, it's self-inflicted? that's a franchise that should be worth three or 4 billion and would, if you had another owner, yeah. but you don't. Um, and it's the same thing with Tampa and some I mean, others, the fluid that flows through the veins of ownership is green. Yeah. And Rob Manfred will be graded on the level of green that he generates in the next franchise transfer. One of the things uh, Rob Manfred has done does it seem to you guys you're but you're both still baseball fans, correct? Absolutely. Marty, you're you're one and Andy. It uh, seems baseball like baseball and fishing. It, yeah. it seems <laughs> like baseball is kind of everywhere now on television. So, uh, do you do you like yeah. that? That's got to be a good thing for the sport. Sure. So the, the reason the, the number one reason why the NFL has become the all as Andy said the mechanized army of of sports or business is that their number one goal was reach and they never they they never went away from that so being on over the air television network television is a primary goal and they're willing to experiment along the way with everything else digital satellite you name it 
Obviously, we know baseball has a different structure. It's much stronger regionally than it is on a national level. And that, I believe, is what baseball is trying to do right now, is they're testing these various other areas of streaming and different day parts, Friday night, Sunday morning, to test and see where that audience is, number one. And number two, in that attempt to do what the NFL does, which is to reach more. The, the issue for, the, for baseball compared to the NFL is they're just 10 times, 20 times more games. And it right. becomes more complicated to carve out something uh, exclusive for a national Apple Plus or Peacock in a time frame where there's not otherwise baseball, which is why ESPN walked away from their last deal and kept Sunday Night Baseball is they had a lot of non-exclusive games during the week that weren't doing anything for the network. Andy? Uh, again, I go back to promotion and marketing you know, is Aaron Judge as big as LeBron James? You know, where is show high? Uh, what national ads is Mike Trout doing? You look at baseball, you can be out and about. I also think that baseball is the beneficiary of an increase in global market, Latin America, Central America, yeah. uh, Mexico, yeah. Canada, um, Japan, Korea. Um, they should be expanding that much more as, as the global operation and not just in the United States. Look at what basketball, again, has done. Uh, hockey's done a pretty good job in Europe, and even football is selling themselves you know, in Europe and occasionally Asia. Mm -hmm. Along those lines, has the World Baseball Classic, has that been a, a forward thinking and a positive for baseball that it's grown the sport? internationally some I, level marty i think it has and i think that's evidenced by number one more teams each time it's played mm -hmm. we started out with a modest amount of nations playing and now that number has grown substantially um so that's number one so bringing in more um and also again getting the owners and players to agree on when it's best played and putting our best best out there but again Keeping this in mind, when you get into globalization in sports, what we have to understand here in the U.S. is we may not always be the best, and that's very us hard to handle. <clears throat> but what you can see in baseball is you can see that emerging Dominican-Puerto Rican rivalry, right, that now becomes imp important. So I think it's been a net, net positive. It's grown the game. I think baseball is going to open their season in 2024 and potentially in Seoul, South Korea. Seoul was one of the hosts of an early round of the World Baseball Classic. So it's a way to test and learn into that. But as Andy said, this is going to have to coalesce together. I think in soccer, I hear them talking about merging the Major League Soccer and Liga MX in Mexico and having some sort of cross-border situation. I would love to see baseball consider some sort of way that they could bring some of those teams together, the club teams, not just the national teams, to play in some sort of meaningful way. That would be a in, step in beyond. year one. Yeah. In year one, uh, Commissioner Martin Conway <laughs> would have the true world series where it would be the United States, yeah. Japan, uh, Korea, the Dominican, Dominican and Korea. Yeah. And that's the world series. You want to really talk about something incredible? That's the World Series. Yeah, right. Let's see how that works. If you just looked at the rosters, Stan, of the All-Star game, and I do think I'll give Major League Baseball a pat on the back, what they did with the pitchers talking to the announcers and mm -hmm. miking, I yes. thought it was terrific. Yes. It really was a win. Um, will they allow that in regular season games? Probably not. And, yeah. But a World Series like that, why not? Yeah. Why not? Hey, speaking of world, uh, we recently, we were in the bidding for a World Cup match uh, or series of matches here in Baltimore. Uh, we combined our effort with D.C. in the 2026. Marty, you know all about it. And I'm sure you do too, Andy, as well. Did, did, you, all, did you both watch the announcement made by FIFA? I did. Were you watching? Were I you, did. Andy? Yes. Okay. They went down the... The West Coast, they started like in Vancouver, and then it was San Fr L.A., San Francisco, the city in Mexico. And they got through, Can they went Kansas City and then Dallas, Houston. and Atlanta suddenly moved from the East Coast 
to the middle of the country. And then it came, it was almost like they couldn't think of a way to screw Baltimore uh, any better than they did. And suddenly Boston, which yeah. is a terrible spot where Foxborough is located to put on uh, World Cup uh, events there. And mm -hmm. suddenly Baltimore and Washington's bid got shut out altogether. Did you, uh, did that yeah. Yeah. go past you guys the same way? Or? No, it, I, I caught that too. And let's be honest. Let's not call Foxborough Boston. Foxborough is Providence, Rhode Island, right? We know it's right. like 24 miles from Providence, Rhode Island, and it's further to Boston. Right. But yeah. But and here, it's, it's essentially like Laurel, putting yeah. a stadium in yeah. Laurel in the middle exactly. of a residential I, I'm sorry to move around. I'm, I'm losing my connectivity here in rural right. Venice, Louisiana. All so right. I might well, have We're to... finishing up in just a minute, but we- so, yeah, but I'll be you... going, Stan, I just want to tell you, I'll be going to dinner with my son at a restaurant that will be serving blue claw crabs in wow. Venice, Louisiana. Great. Okay. Great. So go. talk yeah. about your sponsor and uh, the column that in. they're big in Venice. But did uh, Marty, did, did that, yeah. did you catch that? How Atlanta I, suddenly. I, I did. They shifted that and ultimately, but on this thing. So there's two things I would say about this and we'll move on, which is Baltimore did a fantastic job. Terry and his crew did an outstanding yeah. job. At the end of the day, Washington let them down. And I just want to say that because I think it's true. And that is when the combined bids came together, Washington's component just was not there. And FIFA sensed that. They smelled that. And unfortunately, Boston, Baltimore paid the price for that because Robert Kraft and his family were waiting there. They have been an original investor in MLS from day one. And okay. have held the team that long. So that was the. Yeah, and I was proud. I'm on the San Jose Sports Authority. So really proud of the unified effort, as Marty talked about. These communities, their sports teams, their businesses have to be on the same page. And yeah. we were able to do that to get the game at Levi's. Yeah. Did yeah. we end up losing it, Marty, because we've never really been an MLS place? You well, know? Even, even to the number of 15, 16, 17 cities that made the final cut list before they yeah. got down to 10 or 11, Baltimore was the only city on that list without an active MLS Division I level professional sports franchise. So for what it's right. worth, that's the case. Right. Gentlemen, I'm going to leave it at that. I'll let Marty and I mean, Andy, I'll let you get to dinner and congratulations on what was that, a 90 pound? Tuna that Yellow you bin today? ahi tuna, and if I have any left, and you're willing to pay the shipping, <laughs> it's coming your way. All right. Okay. If you can, coming. can it be frozen and shipped? Can yes, it, it could be frozen and shipped. If it's not, it will be the smelliest tuna <laughs> in the history. Of How are you getting it from from where you caught it in Louisiana? Back I'm home? not allowed to give out that information right. on the national talk shows. Tonight. All right, he is Andy Dolich, <laughs> one of the smartest guys in the room. Um, Marty Conway, one of the other <laughs> smartest guys in the room. They've both been around the sports business world for a long, long time and two of the best at talking about and it. And Stan, I, can I just say this, as I say goodbye, both of us would give the shirts off our back to you. And I won't say another word. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy, as always. I appreciate it. Uh, say hello to David Rubenstein for me. Uh, for uh, I will, I will. Goodbye, guys. For Andy, for Andy Dolich and Marty Conway, uh, I'm going to get out of here after I tell you, and you guys can leave. But I'll tell you about the Costas Inn one more time. Again, Costas Inn, great curbside service. Go to costasin.com. You can order your food, pay for your food, leave your tip, and then go pick it up seamlessly uh, at the Costas Inn at 4100 North Point Boulevard. Whether it's your steamed crabs, your crab cakes, your crab soup, steak, salads, anything else. Uh, the Costasins got it for you, and they're good friends of mine. They've been a sponsor, loyal sponsor of mine, for close to 30 years right now, Marty Conway. That's awesome. Love the Costas in. I can fully right. endorse it. Two thumbs up. All right. Great seeing you today uh, outside of this, and great seeing you here. Thanks great. for the uh, comments. Thanks, All right. Dan. All right. Ross Grimsley and I will be back uh, Monday. Uh, don't know the guest yet, but we'll have somebody – Thursday at two o'clock on August the 11th, we're going to interview Frank Remish, who runs the uh, what used to be the Royal Farms Arena, 
and it will be re re uh, invigorated and reopened come February. We'll talk about some great plans uh, afoot with uh, Frank Remish of the Baltimore Winner. Marty, I'll see you soon. Okay, Stan. Thanks. Bye.